Hi, my name is Doug. I'm speaking to you tonight from the outskirts of Louisville, Kentucky, at a place called Emerald Hills, and that's why we call the channel Emerald Hill Skies. So welcome. Tonight is Labor Day, sort of. It's the very wee hours, the early hours of Labor Day. What we're going to try to do tonight is uh, show you several different types of deep space objects. And one of our uh, areas of growth, we're trying to learn to be able to share these objects a little more rapidly than in the past. So I think we should get started right away. Let's go to our targeting software and let's do a search, uh, a sort rather, for visibility and altitude. And you can see the first object we have listed on our target list is the Andromeda Galaxy. We've already got our telescope connected. So um, let's just right click on that and say uh, salute to the object. And while that's slewing, let's go over and kind of watch in our um, Sky Safari Planetarium program as the field of view, which is this little rectangle you see here that's uh, making its way across the sky. And it's uh, kind of honing in on uh, the Andromeda galaxy. And here in the lower right, you can see uh, a little surveillance camera that we have aimed at the telescope outside. Interestingly, um, that surveillance camera is looking at the scope in absolute darkness. There's no artificial light that's shining on the scope. So it must have its own little pinpoint of uh, infrared there. Now let's go to our imaging software called SharpCap. And in SharpCap, we'll set our time on maybe something like um, 20 seconds. And let's maybe make this gain uh, something like 200, something like that. And we'll, um, we'll do a reset here. We'll put here the, the name is um, M31. And let's uh, begin live stacking. And what live stacking does, it starts to accumulate subframes of this object, one on top of the other. And it's averaging out the best views that it can. So you can see we've already got a um, kind of a poor color balancing view of the sky. And we're just waiting for a couple of frames to come in. While we're doing that, let's say a word about the scope itself. It's a RASA 8, and it's operating on a Skywatcher EQ6R Pro mount. And the mount is that uh, white uh, control device you see at the top of the tripod. And then the telescope, as you can, uh, as you already know, the telescope is the white tube with the black dew shield on the end. Um, interestingly, uh, this RASA doesn't even have a place to put eyepieces. It's designed just for cameras to be able to work. So let's do a, um, a color balance now, the best we can. And let's bring our blacks over just to the right of those peaks. And let's bring our mids in a little. It is a moonless night tonight, uh, just pitch black, just really super clear. So um, Andromeda is going to, it's going to look uh, really nice as the night goes on. And again, we're struggling for the right color balance this evening. But you can see we're starting to pick up um, some nice dust lanes there in between the spiral arms. Something like that. This is more, uh, more art than skill sometimes. OK, 
Okay. <clears throat> you can see we've accumulated eight frames down here in the lower left. And let's see, let me change this so you can see the histogram down there in the lower left. There we go. Something like that, maybe. Something like that. Let's move this up there so that's out of your way so you can see the number of frames. Uh, sometimes it's good to uh, be able to hear some info on this. Let's listen to an audio tour of the M31 and these audio tours are courtesy of our uh, Sky Safari Planetarium program. And uh, I just kind of like to sit back and admire this as we listen. At a habitable planet, we could see our own galaxy up in the nighttime sky just about as bright as M31. The galaxy was known as a nebulous spot long before telescopes were invented. In a clear sky, it is a naked eye object near the middle of the chain of three bright stars that form Andromeda. The Muslim scholar Al Sufi in about 900 AD mentions the little cloud in this part of the sky. M31 can be seen as an elongated ellipse with opera glasses that magnify three times. Simon Marius in 1611 is probably the first person to view M31 in a telescope. He compared it to the light of a candle shining through horn. This is still a good description of M31 in small scopes or on moonlit nights. In dark conditions and with 300 millimeter or larger scopes, two lanes of dusk may be seen accompanying the central portions. M31 is a spiral galaxy, but turned at an angle to us. Its distance is about 3 million light years. Observers of M31 have declared that no telescope yet made is capable of revealing all the wonders of the Andromeda galaxy. I really like the view that the Rasa telescope gives us of M31 with this um, ZWASI 2600 MC Pro camera. It's a very wide field view, and so you really pick up uh, the whole thing. You don't you don't have to look at just a little bit at a time. Look at the way the soot, that's kind of what that dust is. It's just burned carbon. Look at the way that soot uh, creates these dust lanes and those gases swirling around. Of course, this is M31. And uh, let's see if we can refresh our minds. This would be M32 down here. And then that's M110 up there. These are three messy objects in one view. Uh, we've looked at this for about six minutes, and really that's that's uh, what we're going to do tonight, is we're going to just talk about maybe three or four or five, six minutes as we go. This is a particularly beautiful object, so we're just going to save that as seen and head to the next one. So we'll stop the live stacking. We'll go back to our target list. And again, because we're trying to... Um, uh, We're trying to maximize the number of objects that we see. Let's just push on and go to now M52. M52 is an open cluster, and we're just going to do one of these tonight Swing so to that we can so we can see an open cluster and kind of get an idea of what that's like uh, in our Swing complete in our uh, Sky Safari Planetarium program. Sometimes it's good to uh, scoot over here and kind of get an idea of what the sky looks like. So let's back away a little bit, kind of see what our sky looks like. Let's go ahead and give ourselves in our settings uh, a, a horizon so that we kind of have a sense of the the ground uh, in front of us. And you can see here is our um, 
field of view, that little rectangle. And it's looking there at uh, M52. Um, so this would be the ground. And if you were to be able to look straight up, there's the zenith. That would be pointing straight up overhead, 90 degrees. So you can see this is maybe three-fourths the way up the sky. Um, and down here at the bottom, you can see the cardinal directions. You can see we're pointing north, and we're just looking straight up in the sky. And if you look outside at the, at the telescope, you can see that it's pitched over the side, and it's letting the telescope be able to look up at a pretty sharp angle, maybe, um, I don't know, 70 degrees or something up in the sky. All right, let's go over to Sharp Cap now and uh, start our capture. And again, this is M52, so we'll put that here. And what that does is it changes the name. Let's um, zoom in a little bit. And you can see we really don't need to live stack this much at all, if any. We can already see this open cluster. And uh, in this case, it's a nice little grouping of several multicolored stars. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and listen real quickly to what Sky Safari would say about an open cluster. M52 is a galactic cluster located in the rich Cassiopeia constellation in the northern sky. In small telescopes, it appears unresolved with a misty look to it, and a moderate number of faint stars. To see the whole extent of the cluster, a 250 millimeter telescope is desirable. Admiral Smith said the cluster looked like a bird with outstretched wings, but few others would agree. Smith was also the observer who called M11 the wild duck cluster, and most see nothing foul in that cluster either. M52 is a young group and seems to be similar to the Pleiades in its characteristics, yet it is much farther and nearly lost to sight in the vast numbers of stars in this part of the Milky Way. Notice how our stars are, are really overblown for this object. We do better if we maybe set our time on maybe 10 seconds, and um, we'll let it capture another frame there. I think 10 seconds. Yeah, there we go. So you see now the stars are a little more pinpointy. Notice all the different colors there. Some of them are blue. And uh, the significance of that has to do with their age. Um, I've heard the phrase, um, have you ever heard of a, in an open cluster, the phrase blue stragglers? Let's look that up. It's a main sequence star in an open or globular cluster that is more luminous and bluer than stars at the main sequence turnoff point for the cluster. They have two or three times that of the rest of the main sequence cluster stars, and uh, blue stragglers seem to be exceptions to this rule. So it's really um, it's really it has to do with their age uh, and uh, what they're burning at the time and and uh, as you look at this cluster, you get a really nice look. These open clusters like this often remind me of something Christmassy. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what we're doing tonight, is just trying to see several objects. We'll go back to our, um, let's, no, we didn't live stack that. We'll go back to our targeting software now, Astro Planner. And we'll do a quick observation of that, just to note that we looked at it. And let's head to the Dumbbell Nebula. How about that? So we'll slew to that. Slewing to coordinates. And uh, we'll also... Slewing complete. Go to our... This is uh, the Dumbbell Nebula is M76. And let's listen to that audio tour while we get sharp cap set up. M76 is the so-called little dumbbell because it appears to be a little copy of M27, the better known Dumbbell Nebula in the Little Fox. M76 is in Perseus. 
in a region south of the double cluster. Its small size and faintness have combined to give it the reputation as being the most difficult of all the Messier objects to observe. Nevertheless, it is vaguely seen on a good night in a 70 millimeter telescope. A planetary nebula is a cloud of gas that has been released by a star that is undergoing changes. It has been compared to a snake shedding its skin. They commonly look round or sometimes like a little doughnut, as in the case with the famous ring nebula M57. Now let's go back out to our, uh, this is like the native, the native camera view of the entire section of sky. This is about three degrees wide. If you think of your sinking to coordinates, if you think of your sky as being to coordinates, slewing complete, 180 degrees wide across the sky from from horizon to horizon. Imagine if you could just segment like on a protractor, just three degrees of that, just just that angle of three degrees. That's what we're looking at here. So pretty pretty small amount of sky. We'll do 20 seconds at, let's try 200 since we're trying to talk about speed here. Still kind of zeroing in, catching catching this part of the sky. You can see the the sky just slid into its position now as our real view uh, synchronized with the view that uh, we might be able to um, oops I'm going to need to clear this the the real view synchronizes with our library view and our telescope uh, by, by the means of the mount it synchronizes with that live view so that way we make sure we're pointing right at the object um we're kind of seeing a first frame here. You can see it has a real green tinge. So we'll back off the greens a little bit. And then um trying to get our our blacks. I'll scoot over here so you can see sharp cap as well. Trying to get our blacks black enough here. Yeah. And then bring our mids in so this object starts showing up. Now, they don't call this the little dumbbell for nothing, do they? Because it is very little. We're going to zoom in at 100%. And then um, we're seeing a lot of grain at this point. That grain will disappear. As time goes on, uh, it'll be lessened by our frames that we're stacking together. Some of that uh, grain might be because we're might be um, amplified because we're at 200 gain and 20 seconds. But again, that's that's because we're trying to maximize the number of objects that we see in a shorter amount of time. Um, the Rasa shows us a very wide section of the sky. So picking out a very small object like this is um, not necessarily the Ross's strong point, is it? Uh, this is a very tiny object. Let's see if we can calculate exactly how wide this is. This would be, be around two arc minutes. So if you imagine going from one end of the horizon to the other being 180 degrees, and then collapse that down to just looking at one single degree. So now you've taken these 180 degrees and you're looking at just one of them. And then imagine taking that one degree and slicing it up into 60 minutes. Um, because each degree can be divided in 60 minutes. Now this object is so tiny, it would just be two of those minutes. So it's extremely tiny. You can see that as we're up to two minutes and 40 seconds now of integration of this data, already the uh, the magic of live stacking frames is starting to drop out more and more of that grain, that grain being all that noisy stuff in the background. And the reason why that drops out is because 
the software here, SharpCap, is averaging out the it's averaging out the stars and it's watching the grain move from one picture to the next and it's trying to pick out which thing is moving and which thing is not and the grain since it's not real it's just a it's just a you might call it noise in the picture caused by electrical circuits and the sky having a little bit of poor seeing sometimes and all the light from the city of Louisville and all those things, that's what causes all that grain. Because it's not like a pinpoint star, the software is sharp enough, it's smart enough to start dropping out that grain and showing us just the beauty of the object here. We're not using anything that the astronomers call darks or flats here. This is just the pure, pure camera. And you can see one hot pixel, perhaps. If you look really closely in your frame, you might be able to see this little patch of blue. That's just a hot pixel. We are cooling our camera. And the camera's down at 8 degrees centigrade. And we just get it down there to get rid of most of those hot pixels. So it is an astro, it's an astro specific camera that we can sort of freeze using a fan and also a thermo cooler. Uh, but as you can see over here to the right, if you can look at the far right, we're not using any darks or flats. And usually we don't really need them for this kind of viewing. Now you can see that little, uh, little miniature nebula, this little miniature dumbbell. And it is fascinating to think about how these form. Uh, these nebula are collections of gas. And the green, for instance, might be oxygen. And then right out here at the edge, you might just start seeing a little bit of red. That might be hydrogen. And these gases are made as uh, the, as the, um, the, the gases that are they're blowing out from these stars, they're made because they're lit up and backlit and they become ionized uh, so that they, they see different things. Now, this is a specific kind of uh, nebula called a planetary nebula. And what, what is interesting about this is uh, it's kind of blowing out in two directions. And... We don't really understand all of this. Some people think that's got to do with the gravity or polarity of the star. Either way, this outer shell is being sent out, and that makes that sort of uh, round shape. And then the, the gas that's slower is sent out, making this kind of inner core shape. And these planetary nebula, nebulae they were observed by the early astronomers, and they kind of thought they were maybe planets, and thus the name, and it just sort of stuck. But they aren't. They're just collections of gas that are being lit up and ionized by stars in between them. So that's all we're going to do for this, uh, this uh, M76 tonight, because we are trying to learn to move a little faster in our observing uh, so we're going to move on to the next. We are stopping our live stacking and going back to our targeting software so that we can move on to the next object. So, so far we've seen a, um, a galaxy and we've also seen um, a, an open cluster and we've seen now a planetary nebula. Let's look at a globular cluster. So let's slew to that next right now slewing to coordinates this is m15 so we'll put m15 in our target name here perhaps you can see the telescope here east changing directions and the way equatorial mounts work which is the kind of mount we have when the telescope changes the side that it's leaning uh, down into so that it can move to look at objects in the sky 
That's called Pier East or Pier West. And now you can see it's just switched over. Viewing complete. So now we're in the general part of the sky, and we'll switch over to our um, to our imaging software. Again, we use a imaging software called SharpCap, and because we're taking 20-second images here, when the telescope first gets into position, uh, it takes a minute for that first image to come into uh, position. And when it comes into position, um, let's go back down to our big view. I see that globular cluster there. Let's do a um, plate solve just to make sure we're aimed correctly. And then with each plate solve that we do, it's um, entering some information into the mount so that it becomes more and more accurate as the night goes on. Finally, you don't have to do this plate solving anymore. So again, it's comparing the live view through the scope with its uh, library of cataloged images, and it's deciding how to adjust the scope so that it's pointing directly at the object. So as we see that happening, it then gives us a report, and we are about to coordinates. We are about 0.44 slewing complete. 0.44 degrees off, and the reason that you would be 0.44 degrees off after you've changed sides of the mount is because now the mount is hanging off in a different direction. And there's a little bit of play when the mount switches sides because the, the, the way the gears work. So now we've, we've made our uh, adjustment and we're ready to start live stacking. So we'll click the live stack and clear the last image and it'll start stacking this one. Um, so this is M76. While that's stacking, let's just listen to an audio tour of, of M76. M76, here it goes. M76 is a so-called little dumbbell because it appears to be a little copy of M27, the better known dumbbell nebula in the... I'm sorry, that was our last object, wasn't it? We're at M15 now. So what that tells me is that I forgot to change the name of the title up here. I wonder if I can change that on the fly and this. Right away, we're getting a great, a great image of this. Bring this right here. Hopefully get rid of some more of that greenish tinge. There we go. And uh, these always remind me of Christmas decorations too. They're, they're so like a snowball. Let's zoom in now. Take a look at that. Let's listen to the proper narration of M15 so that we can hear at least one um, description of, an, of a globular cluster. M15 is a magnificent globular star cluster at the western side of Pegasus, the celestial flying horse. The cluster is found by starting near Epsilon Pegasus, a naked eye star about 4 degrees south. Sweep north to find M15. In binoculars, the cluster is seen as a tiny gray dot. Small telescopes easily show some of the starry marvels in this large star cluster. M15 was discovered in 1746 by Moraldi while he was seeking a comet in that year. The comet is long gone, but M15 remains as one of the showpiece objects of the Pegasus Andromeda areas. In larger telescopes, a faint and small planetary nebula can be glimpsed within M15. Good seeing and at least a 250 millimeter telescope are required to spot the elusive cloud around a star. 
How about that? A planetary nebula is visible here. So to see that, let's um, let's zoom in in our while that's stacking just a brief bit. Let's zoom in here in our sky safari. Planetary Nebula. Wonder where which that is. Usually Sky Safari uses a um a circle with crosshairs through it. So do you think this entire thing is a planetary nebula? Hmm. Let's go back to our sharp cap and um, M15. This is interesting to me. Also designated NGC 7078. Lots of variable stars and pulsars, including one double neutron. It also contains PEAS-1, P-E-A-S-E-1, -E the first planetary nebula discovered within a globular cluster. So it's inside of this. Huh. So I wonder if I say PEAS-1, yeah. See if I can. Wow, it's just off to the center of it. And it's kind of in the direction of that little yellow star. So let's go back to Sharp Cap now. And so there's a little yellow star. Hmm, I'm going to go back to 100%. Are you looking at sharp cap with me? Yes. There's a little yellow star. So this planetary nebula is down in here, almost inside of that nucleus. We've stacked for about five minutes. Hmm, how interesting. A tiny planetary nebula. Anybody see it? I wonder if it's maybe this thing right here. Very small. Anyway, uh, this is a globular cluster. It looks more like a snowball than the open cluster that we saw a while ago. So six minutes is it. We're going to just save exactly a scene. And um, then we're going to go back to our uh, targeting software. While we do that, I'm also going to look in the uh, live stream. And I don't expect we have anybody here listening in because this was an unexpected live stream. Um, in the middle of the night, it's 2.11 a.m. So I am not seeing anybody else uh, there. And I didn't expect to see anyone because it is the middle of the night. Who Who's going to be up at 2 a.m. cruising YouTube just in case somebody live streams? Uh, did no promotion for this at all. It's just I saw the clear night and I realized tomorrow was Labor Day and I thought, let's do this. Um, so we're back in our planning software. That was M15, the Great Pegasus Cluster. And what I'm doing here is just doing quick observations on each of these. Let's go to M33. It's our first galaxy. How about that? So let's slew to that. Slewing to coordinates. And uh, while we're slewing, 
maybe you can see the telescope running there. I wonder if I go to this, if we can maybe make that bigger and you can see a little bit bigger view of the scope as it's Pier West. slewing. See that box that's up on top? That little box is a homemade distribution box for all of the power and the signal devices. And then see how it's counterbalanced on the other end with those weights that are kind of sticking out there. Slewing uh, complete. That keeps the mount uh, exactly balanced. If you take the clutches loose and let it sit, it just stays in the very same spot because um, it's perfectly balanced. And that's the way equatorial mounts are designed to work. So this is M33, the pinwheel galaxy. M33. So let's go to our um, sharp cap now. M33. And let's stop our live stack and put in the M33 here. What it's doing now is it's capturing that first frame. And remember, we have it on 20 seconds. And We'll let the mount sort of settle in because actually you can see some little bit of still movement as the mount was arriving in its new location. That's when that image finished. So now once that green bar graph down at the bottom arrives, and let's set this back on auto. So we zoom back out. Since we switched sides of the pier, let's do a plate solve. And while that plate solve is happening, let's listen to this M33 um, description in our Uh, Sky Safari. M33 is Sinking a great pinwheel galaxy, one of the closest Sluing large to galaxies to our Sluing own. Complete. It gets its name from the pinwheel form visible on photographs. To the backyard observer, M33 looks like a pale circular disk. It is within the little visited constellation Triangulum. On nights where clouds or the moon rain nearby, M33 is hard to spot, since although it is a large object, it will not show itself if the sky contrast is poor. In dark skies, it is an easy object in binoculars, and has been seen with the unaided eye, provided one knows exactly where to look. M33 is located more than 3 million light-years from Earth. The Milky Way galaxy, M33, and M31 are the three largest galaxies in our local group of two dozen island universes. Okay, so instantly when that first image hits, you can already see there's something there, can't you? Right there in the middle. It's amazing. This Rasa telescope is known for being uh, very fast. They use that word fast. Uh, uh, to Telescope makers use that word fast to signify that it can acquire a lot of photons very efficiently and quickly compared to other telescopes so that you get to see the object more quickly. I guess that's that's one way of looking at it. And then what we do down here at the bottom, if you've noticed, we move these little sliders around and that adjusts the, the amount of blacks and mid-level tones and we also can do color balancing much better there. Wow, isn't that beautiful? No wonder they call it the pinwheel galaxy, right? You can use these mids to chase those little arms, little spiral arms in a little bit more. We want the uh, background to stay kind of black though, don't we? So that the arms show up in contrast to the black. But like I say, this is more art 
that it is skill. Once you get too many mids, then you get this faint background glow from the, I think at that point what you're seeing is we're starting to pick up the city glow. We're in about Bortle 6 skies here. The Bortle scale is a scale that helps you know how, how much light pollution there is in your area. And we have about Bortle 6 here. It's quite a lot. Um, we'll just enlarge this a little bit. Wow, that is incredible, isn't it? Look at those spiral arms. Look at all that stuff that's being slung around in a spiral shape. Are you seeing this? Is this in your way? We can make this a little bit smaller. What if we put this on the other side? So it's kind of out of your way. That's a little better, isn't it? Boy, I don't know what you're seeing there in your YouTube version, but in this version, I'm seeing lots of little stars out there in the middle of this M33. I'm curious if all of those stars are in the object or if some of them are actually just in front of the galaxy, kind of like in between us and the galaxy. This is 20, I'm sorry, 2.73 million light years away. So that's kind of far, but it's, um, it's at least in our local group of galaxies behind the, um, it's the third largest in our local group. It's one of the most distant permanent objects that you can sometimes catch in, an, in a naked eye view if you're in particularly dark skies. And the largest star, Aeneas star, is the brightest star in the galaxy. So which would be Aeneas star? That be maybe this? Oh, no, but I wonder if some of these are, we got multiple arms. Look how this arm now is starting to show up. We've been accumulating material, integrating for about four minutes. Look how far this arm is showing now, slinging stuff out. Isn't it amazing that's up there all the time in the sky and because we live in the cities nowadays, most of us aren't able to see this till we get a telescope. And even then we have to know exactly where to point the telescope because of all the city city mess. Man, I could just look at that and look at that and look at that. That is so fascinating. But we're trying to move quickly tonight, trying to learn to move at a better pace. So this is five minutes. Let's go ahead and save this. And again, that's uh, M33. And it's also known as the Triangulum Galaxy or Pinwheel Galaxy. Okay. All right, so let's stop our live stack and go back to our targeting software. And the next thing is, you know how we looked at the little dumbbell a while ago? That was M76. Now we're gonna look at the regular normal dumbbell. It's the M27. So let's slew there. Slewing to coordinates. M27. And again, um, if you um, Peer East. if you can tell the the telescope's changing sides again, the way it lays back, I kind of almost imagine that it's kind of, you know how you lay back and look up at the stars? That's kind of what it's doing, isn't it? Kind of laying back and kind of Slewing looking up, complete. looking up at the stars.
I love this design, this telescope design, the Rasa, Rowe, Ackerman, Schmidt, Astrograph. Uh, to be honest, uh, I'm, Lord willing, we're going to build an observatory here at Emerald Hills, a little eight foot one, not a large, a large dome. And uh, we're going to, when that observatory is done, we're going to put a Rasa 11 in it and sell this Rasa 8. Uh, the Rasa 11 will give us even more uh, photons. You'll be able to see even more of the sky more quickly. So that day is coming. I think um, we'll see it faster than we think. Let's go ahead and um, let's do a plate solve just so we can adjust on this side of the mount. Um, so the Rasa 11 is almost like barrel shaped. It's so it's so um, it's so much broader. The aperture is 11 inches, and the focal length is longer. It ends up with uh, a little bit closer view on objects. About 50% uh, zoomed in on these objects. So you might lose a little bit of your um, wide angle, but I think we'll put up with that just so we have that extra aperture, and that lets us see more light. Sinking to coordinates. About slewing to coord slewing complete. Thirty two hundredths of a degree off that we'll we'll be able to um, correct here. When we start live stacking, I'm assuming that this is oh, there was a little movement yet to be had, so I'm glad we waited. So we'll kind of zero in on, can you see that splotch? It's already there. Now we'll start our live stack. We'll clear the last live stack. And while that's coming in, let's listen to the description of M27, the kind of the regular dumbbell nebula, M27. M27 is a famous dumbbell nebula in Volpecula, or the Little Fox. Few deep sky objects are as mysterious and appealing as M27. It is a planetary nebula or cloud of gas being evolved by a star. M27 looks like a small elliptical cloud, quite bright in binoculars. Small telescopes reveal the two lobes, which is how the dumbbell got its name. Still larger scopes show an empty portion near the middle that is filled with a faint gas. What is the major axis is now seen to be the minor axis of a larger ellipse of faint blue gas. M27 is one of the larger planetary nebula. The name was selected by Herschel and was based on his observation that these look like the faded disks of planets. Of course, there's no real connection with planets. It's just a name that stuck. Can you see that star in the middle? I think this is amazing that that object is up there all through the year it's in the sky and we we don't ever look at it. Look at the way the Rasa is bringing out these uh, reddish hydrogen areas, and I guess these greenish oxygen areas and look at that star right in the middle and that's what caused those puffs to be able to be um, you know sprayed out there fascinating, isn't it, to think that that's up there all the time. Look at this material here being sprayed out the edges. Again, this, uh, this whole planetary nebula thing to me is fascinating, partly because it's such a weird thing to think about that a central star sort of blew up in a way, not exactly like a supernova. It began casting off its outer uh, layers and became a white dwarf. So that star that you're looking at in the middle there, right there in the middle, if you've never seen a white dwarf before, now you can say that you saw one. 
And eventually, what happens to these planetary nebulae is that they'll eventually blow out completely and the white dwarf will go away completely. But uh, certainly, it'll be there long after our lifetime. Um, might be a thousand years from now, who knows? But boy, those, this especially reminds me of Christmas, I guess with the green and red, right? Wow, think about that. We're just three minutes and 40 seconds in and we're gonna save and stop live stacking because we've looked at M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. And now we're gonna go to our next object, wow. So what do you think of this pace? Kind of tell me if you like this or not. This next thing is another galaxy, it's M74. Slewing to coordinates. And uh, it's sometimes called the Phantom, which is kind of a mysterious name, huh? M74, also known as NGC 628. M74, the Phantom. Pier West. Changing sides again. So these trails that you see when you go back to sharp cap, those are not satellites. That's the trail of the stars as the camera finished out its previous exposure. Complete. And it's kind of sliding across the sky. So in the time exposure, you're seeing the stars make a photographic scratch, so to speak, across the sensor. And then once that next uh, exposure comes in, now they're pinpointed, okay? So we'll just be official and do our plate solve. Let's back out to, I uh, wonder if I should back out to auto first before I plate solve, probably. And again, this is um, M74. Oh, it doesn't let us fill in the name while it's plate solving. M74, and again, that's known as the Phantom, or uh, NGC 628. M74, 2.30 a.m. Well, I'm glad you're with us. Apparently, you're watching Sinking this. Sinking to coordinates. You're watching this Slewing as a to coordinates. Slewing complete. As a recorded version, because I don't think we have anybody watching live. Oh, we might have one person that stopped by and watched it live. I'm going to go look at this myself on YouTube with my phone. And I'll turn the volume down so we don't get Yeah, so we don't get um, an echo. That'll let me see if somebody stops and comments. But if you're watching this recorded, thanks for kind of reliving this through with us. We're looking right now at M74, and we just synchronized our mount with this part of the sky. So I think now we'll start live stacking. We'll clear out the previous image and let that start accumulating. And while it's accumulating, let's listen to a description of this object, uh, M33. I like these galaxies. Um, 33, it's kind of amazing stuff. M33 is a great pinwheel galaxy, one of the closest large galaxies to our own. It gets its name from the pinwheel form visible on photographs. To the backyard observer, M33 looks... I just remembered we did M33. This is M74. So let's um, listen to the different narration of M74. M74. 
M74 is a wonderful galaxy in Pisces the fish. Photos show a very beautiful face-on spiral galaxy. Yet M74 is frustrating to observe. It has a very low surface brightness. Initially it was believed to be an unresolved globular cluster. Only later did it become clear that M74 is a spiral galaxy. This object is visible as a bright patch in the sky, even in smaller scopes. But a low power is desirable, for under too much magnification, the tendency is to sweep by the object without being able to see it. Observers have been frustrated in first spotting M74 in binoculars or a finder scope, but when turning the bigger telescope being unable to see it in the eyepiece. The best cure for these ills is not advice, but practice. Again, the kind of astronomy that we use here on Emerald Hill Skies uh, channel is called electronically assisted astronomy. And we call it that because we're getting assistance from all these uh, electronic tools. For example, uh, the camera is high sensitivity and uh, the scope is very fast. And then from our software, we get another boost because we stack frames on top of each other. And that allows us to figure out which thing in the frame is uh, something that is actually there and which thing is just noise. So although in our narration from Sky Safari, you can hear the guy say, it's frustrating to observe. What he's really talking about is it's frustrating to observe in the old fashioned kind of astronomy, when you had to look through an eyepiece. But look, we've only been looking at this object for two minutes, a little over two minutes, and you can already tell it's actually easy to observe if you're using electronically assisted astronomy or electronically assisted visual astronomy. It's kind of using all the stuff that you need to do astrophotography, but you're just not doing astrophotography. Instead, you're kind of focusing in on that object and just appreciating it for its sake and just enjoying it. And you might stay three minutes, you might stay five minutes, you might stay nine minutes, just depends on how much data you receive and how much you need. But you can see why they call this a phantom. It kind of like wafts in there like a ghost, doesn't it? And the longer we stay on this uh, object, the more frames we drink in. Right now we've, we've already uh, captured 11 frames over the last four minutes now. 12 frames, these, these frames go on top of one another and they just accentuate all those um, hazy splotched parts of this object. Pretty soon we're seeing these long extending arms, which might mean that M33 interacted with another galaxy and it kind of pulled that arm out a little bit loose because I don't think this arm out this side is at all uh, pulled out like that. So I'm just going to look and make sure I see exactly what you're looking at. Yeah, that's right. This is a ghostly object. I, I think that's a good name for it. M33, the uh, phantom. I'm sorry, M74. M74, I keep saying M33. Now, I wonder when we save this, will it save it under the new name? I think it will in this new version of SharpCap. Okay, so let's stop our live stacking after just five minutes. And wow, let's just get one more fleeting glimpse, glimpse of M74. And let's go to Neptune if we can. Let's see if we can find Neptune. Slewing to coordinates. Neptune, as you know, is one of our planets, and when astronomers dropped complete. Pluto from the list, it made Neptune the farthest out planet. Excuse me, it must be getting really late, 2.36 a.m. Um, we do want to do a good job of... Um,
doing this plate solve and sync, because in this case, I think I already see Neptune, but let's be sure. Limit warning. Uh-oh. That means we're too far over. So um, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to Sky Safari and um, We're over the, I think I'm going to fix that real quick just by. Slewing to coordinates. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That Slewing was, complete. There was, maybe you can see the scope. It was leaning so far backward beyond the meridian. It was like it was starting to say, if I go back any farther, I'm going to hit the tripod. I'm going to break my back, so to speak. So to find Neptune, let's see. How do we do this? This hasn't, hasn't happened to me very, very much. I wonder if I go to an object farther across so that it makes it have, to, to, coordinates. have to switch peers. Yeah. So in a minute, you'll hear it say Pier West. And what that means is it's crossed over the meridian. That way it's not breaking its back anymore. So you see it kind of slewing there? Pier East. Pier East, I mean. Um, so let's see. There's, there you can see it's starting to lean over in the east. The telescope's now on the east side of the pier. Now let's go back to Neptune. Slewing complete. So let's go to Neptune now. Slewing to coordinates. What we've done is we've tricked it. Slewing complete. So it's not leaning backwards over the, the meridian anymore. Now let's go back to sharp cap. Sharp cap is an amazing program, isn't it? It has a lot of tools for astronomers as well. We use one tool called uh, polar alignment in sharp cap. And what that does is helps you align your mount with the pole star so that when the sky glides by, you don't have to use two motors. It just it just actuates the right ascension motor only. And that makes it also more accurate to be able to follow stars across the sky and objects. So you get a good view in this case of that box up on top. Let's do a plate solve now. You get a good view of that box on top in this this view, um, let's see, scope cam. See that box on top? You can kind of almost look inside that box now and see some of the electronics in there. Sinking to coordinates. The douche. Slewing to coordinates. Slewing the complete. The do buster we have inside of there as well. Now we're centered right over Neptune. So trying to find how do we compare this? Guess we can look at this little arc. It's like a five a five star parabolic dish. And then Neptune should be right in the middle of that five star parabolic dish. Let's back out to like forty percent or maybe even all the way for a minute. Let's go to sixteen percent. Hmm. So 
this might be the parabolic dish. And then Neptune is out in front of that. Yeah. So. Hmm. It's harder, isn't it? Let's uh, live stack and clear the last live stack. And while that's live stacking, let's switch over to the planetarium software. And let's try to see Boy, we ought to be able to figure this out, huh? There are two bright ones, and then a slightly dim, and then an orange one, and a parabolic dish. Hmm. So I'm thinking those are the... Let's see. Let's pull these blocks over. Are you looking at um, sharp cap with me? Let's go there. Let's pull these blocks over. Well, we should probably do a color balance first. Hmm. Okay. Now, orientation might not be quite right. see we're looking for something to be right in the middle so let's move that bar right in the middle and this so Neptune should be that I think I think it's that, but you can see it's not turning into a disk. Just a little bit globby. globby. Yeah, I think that's Neptune right there in the middle. Had you ever seen Neptune before tonight? We find out that's a 150%, so the Rasa is not going to be able to resolve it as a disk. Why don't we um, drop this down to like three seconds and see if looking at the sky... with blacker skies will also help us let's go all the way out to auto. Boy, I'm trying to find that same number of stars that the planetarium software showed us. You have bright, 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 dim, dim. And then it finishes with very dim. <laughs> Anybody see it? I would think that's it right there in the middle because our plate solving usually puts things right smack in the middle. So let's go with that assumption. What is that? Some kind of satellite? This is Neptune. Hmm. 
Yeah, look at that. Almost see something out on the edge. I wonder if, look at that thing on the edge. Let's go back to our, oh, that's the moon, married. That's exactly what that is. We're seeing the moon. I wonder if we make that 150. Can you see that moon out there on the edge of it? It's just barely. Well, we're up to four minutes and a half, so we have to go soon. That's it. That's Theron. Pretty cool. It's back at 100% so we don't get any of that mosaic effect, but we can actually lower our blacks. Right there. Make that sky. Wow. Neptune. How about that? All right. So let's look back over at the video and how this is going. Um can't tell how long it's been going, but I'm wondering if we ought to um, stop just so it's manageable for you. And we've got a bunch of other things here. Let's go to the Pleiades, just because that's such a different looking open cluster. And the Ring Nebula, that would be fun too. Oh, let's go to these. So I'm gonna stop live stacking if I was live stacking. Let's put in um, M57. M57. to the object. Slewing to coordinates. M57. We use um, a broadcasting software called OBS to be able to Slewing complete. manage all these frames, all these different windows. Can you see down here at the bottom? This is our power box. That's where we bring the AC electric in. It's about 200 feet out there in the field. We bring 200 feet of 12 gauge power wire into that box and then convert it to 12 volts so that the um, uh, scope can use it, the, the mount and the camera and the, let's see the mount, the camera, the fan, but one piece uses 24 volts, and that's the uh, connectivity that allows us to talk to the scope. It's a Icron Raven uh, USB extender device, and it uses 24 volts. So we actually have two little transformers in that homemade project box there. Okay, so we're at the M57. Um, I think we're ready to start live stacking. Clear the last live stack. Oh yeah, the first image, look at that. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's uh, almost haunting. Look at all that noise which will all, we'll get all that fixed. Wow. 
or at least a lot of it. It's fascinating, isn't it? How the supernova explosion is still being witnessed today because we can see the it's kind of like fireworks, like a shell went off. Did you ever go to fireworks and went poof? That's kind of what you're seeing here. If you study it very closely, you can see the star in the middle. That star in the middle will become more and more apparent as time goes on. A little too much there. You don't want the sky to turn green. Wow, that's fascinating. That is 100%, so this is a tiny object. Let's find out how tiny that is. Um, this is uh, M27, is it? M57, M57. Hmm. 230 arc seconds. Tiny. Wow, that's beautiful, isn't it? All right. Well, I think we're going to we're going to finish with this ring nebula just so that we can pack up and hit the sack. But uh, so I'll keep you apprised on how our progress goes for our observatory. I think the um, slab is supposed to go in as, as we do this, as we record this, is September 6th. I think the slab and the pier pedestal, the concrete part, will be done, Lord willing, September 27th. That's when we're going to do that. Around about that same time, I hope, the metal portion of the pier arrives in the top plate. Then we can fasten the mount on. It's going to be an Ioptron CEM70G. So it has the electronics built into it. And then, uh, uh, and the guide scope, by the way, and has the wiring built in so that you won't have uh, that cable uh, wafting down anymore. The wiring's all going to be inside the mount. And then we'll be able to mount the Rasa 11 on that. Once the pier arrives, once the concrete's done and the pier arrives, we can start using the Rasa 11. This is a Rasa 8, 8 inches wide. And then I don't know when the observatory will arrive, but we build it on the slab when the observatory comes. So, Well, I hope you can appreciate how beautiful these objects are. Uh, we've tried to cover several uh, and uh, let's see, I guess we did um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, well, let's do one last object so it's an even 10, right? Yeah. So let's save this one more time and then uh, stop live stacking. And let's go to uh, Pleiades M45. Slewing to coordinates. And that telescope can watch it slew there. Pier West. You've probably seen these when you were little M45. Some people call them the Seven Sisters because there are roughly seven stars in this slewing complete it's not exactly seven some people just see six depends on what you're seeing excuse me m45 let's put that in our title box before i forget m45 and let's back out to 
auto so we can see the big picture. And we'll go ahead and play it solve just to be consistent. I can already tell that's Pleiades, oh hum. Looks like a little tiny dipper that's the handle is down. You scoop full of water and then scooped it on through the water and now the water's sinking to coordinates. Slewing to coordinates. slewing complete. Water's kind of spilling out. We'll let it finish the last frame there so that, see how those stars are elongated in this case because it caught it during the last frame. Okay, now let's start live stacking. Pleiades, seven sisters. Let's listen to a, um, description of Pleiades. It's very, very unique. Got that nebulosity around it. M45 is the Pleiades star cluster. Called the Seven Sisters, it is a naked eye tight knot of five to eight stars depending on conditions and the watcher's eyesight. Since the Pleiades require no optical aid to observe, it has been known and named from the earliest times. The name Pleiades seems to mean full, and this is the impression of the eye when seeing these stars. It looks to the naked eye like many open clusters do in the field of view of a telescope. Since the Pleiades are so large and clear, they are best viewed with small telescopes or binoculars. Large telescopes spoil things, and M45 can't be fitted into the narrow area of the high-powered instrument. Pleasing views are obtained in seven-power binoculars, or even in opera glasses that magnify three or four times. Here the Seven Sisters now become 30 or 40. The cluster has several hundred members, but its riches can be easily sampled in a handheld glass. The object is set in a faint nebula, but photography is usually required to see much of this. Most stars in M45 are bluish, and it is one of the youngest star clusters in the heavens. Now, notice at 3 seconds and 200 gain, we're seeing that perfectly well. But to get that nebulosity, let's... Increase this to maybe, I don't know, 20 seconds. That might be too much. These stars will really blow out. Uh, but we're trying to see just a little bit of that blue nebulosity around it. There you go. Starting to see it now. Wow, you're starting to see it. Look, see the blue. Are you looking at the right thing? Oh, you're still in the scope. Sorry, <laughs> my bad. Let's take you back to sharp cap. Look at the way you're starting to see the blue image around the scope now. Let's zoom in maybe 16%. No, maybe 33 and then get it oriented correctly. Yeah. See how you're starting to see those blue clouds? We might be able to go into 40. Yeah. Look at that. That's so awesome to be able to pick up that nebulosity after just uh, two minutes. Wow. Those are amazing stars, aren't they? they... Right there is where it should be. Man, that's a good one to end on. Well, thank you for spending this time with us tonight. Um, it's really been clear. Seeing conditions were excellent. Uh, no moon. And wow, uh, maybe it's because it's after a rain. It cleaned the sky. And I appreciate you being with us so late at night. Uh, and I hope to see you in the next one. No matter what, remember that these things are too wonderful to think that they all happen by accident. Uh, so when you look up at the Emerald Hill skies, I hope you can figure out, wow, 
Somebody had to do that, you know, to make it that beautiful. That's what we believe anyway here. Look at that nebulosity. Okay, hope you have a great evening, and I'll see you in the next one. God bless.